I just spent the last week combing through every single line of Drizzle's documentation and taking extensive notes along the way, and I compiled all this together for this one single crash course, so by the end of this video, you'll know everything you need to know about Drizzle so that you can start using it in your very own projects. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. Now for this Drizzle tutorial, I have a very basic project setup that I have three dependencies installed. I have the types for Node, I have TSX, which is kind of like Nodemon, it allows us to run TypeScript files really easily, and then I have TypeScript itself installed. I have a simple TS config that I pulled straight from Vite, doesn't really matter what yours looks like, and then I have this main file that does almost nothing. In my package JSON, you can see if I run npm run dev, it uses that TSX command to run my main file, and anytime I make a change inside of here and save, you can see it outputs that to my console. Now, the very first thing I want to talk about is what Drizzle is. Drizzle is an ORM, which is an object relation manager. Essentially, it just allows you to interact with the database really easily instead of writing raw SQL queries. Now, Drizzle is a little bit different than a lot of other popular ORMs such as Prisma, and if you want to learn more about the differences between Drizzle and Prisma, I have a full video, I'll link in the cards and description for you, but I like to do a little bit of an analogy comparing Drizzle and Prisma, and they're very similar to Tailwind versus Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a really great way in CSS to write out your CSS because it has built-in components like cards, buttons, tables, and so on. So when you write out a project using Bootstrap, it's really easy to make something quick and dirty because you have all these components built in. But as soon as you start needing to make customizations to the cards or buttons that are built in, it can be difficult because these features are not built into Bootstrap. So it's easy to get started with something that works pretty well for most use cases, but as soon as you need to customize it, it gets a little bit tricky and sometimes even impossible. Tailwind CSS, on the other hand, is really great because it's super flexible. It allows you to essentially just write normal CSS, but in Tailwind's way of doing things, it's a very light wrapper on top, and it gives you a nice little design structure to work within. So it's incredibly flexible, but it requires more upfront work to actually get your styles working. That's how Drizzle is. Prisma is kind of like the bootstrap way of doing things where everything's kind of built in for you, but customizing it is difficult, while Drizzle is a very light abstraction on top of SQL, so it's very similar to SQL. If you're already familiar with SQL, it'll be easy to learn, but it allows you that extra flexibility that something like Prisma doesn't have nearly as easily. So this is great if you're already familiar with SQL and want something a little bit more flexible, but if you don't know SQL, Drizzle is actually going to be pretty hard to actually work with. Now, luckily, I do have a completely free SQL crash course. I'll link it in the cards and description for you. That'll get you up and running with the basics of SQL. Now, to actually get a project set up and running with Drizzle, you'll see that there's three different components to Drizzle. There's the Drizzle ORM, the Drizzle Kit, and then the Drizzle Studio. For now, we're going to focus specifically on the ORM. And if we come into here to look at the actual documentation, you'll notice that there's these getting started documentations for Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite. In our case, I'm going to be using the Postgres getting started documentation. And immediately, you'll notice when you go to one of these pages that there's a bunch of lists of different database drivers at the top of the page. And that's because Drizzle allows you to use your own driver that you want to use. So for example, you can use Neon, you can use Postgres.js, you can use Node Postgres, you can use Supabase, you can even just use HTTP. There's a bunch of different ways you can interact with Drizzle and each database has their own drivers. And depending on which one you choose, there's going to be slightly different getting started instructions. So if we scroll down a little ways, you'll notice in this Postgres.js section, this is the driver that I'm gonna be using for this tutorial. This gives me the exact getting started instructions on how I set up that driver. Now, depending on which driver and database you choose, you're going to want to go through your own getting started instructions, but they're all very similar to each other. So I'm going to go through the getting started for this and kind of talk about where the differences are. So first we need to install the things that we need. So we need to install drizzle ORM. So npm i drizzle dash ORM. That's going to be the thing you need no matter what. And then the second thing we're going to install is our driver. So in our case, we're using the Postgres driver. So we're going to install Postgres. Depending on what driver you use, that second thing you install will be different. Now, once that's done, we're also need to go to install Drizzle Kit. And this essentially allows us to do things like database migrations and generating SQL migrations and all the different stuff related to Drizzle interacting with your database. So we can come in here, npm i, we want to save this as a dev dependency, and it's called Drizzle Kit, just like that. Those are the only dependencies we're going to need. And again, depending on what driver you choose, this dependency right here may be slightly different. Now, the last library I'm going to install is not technically needed, but it makes it a little bit easier to work with environment variables. I'm just going to type in npm i.env. That'll allow us to create a file called .env and put things like a database URL into here for connecting. So it's a little bit easier and safer to put our database URL in a safe location instead of hard coding it inside of our code. 
So now we can go through the steps of actually setting up Drizzle. And these are steps you're going to follow pretty much no matter what driver you decide to use. So the first thing you want to do is to create a Drizzle config file. This is going to be anywhere you want. I recommend just doing it at the root of your application. So we'll say Drizzle dot config dot ts because we're going to be using TypeScript for this. And inside of here, we need to import the Drizzle config directly from Drizzle kit. So make sure we get this from Drizzle kit just like that. And this is actually called define config. There we go. So we're going to get the define config function. And then we can export that as a default variable by calling define config. And we can pass it in all of our different configuration options. Now, the most important options that you're going to need to have passed along is going to be where your schema file is going to be. So this is going to be the path to our schema file. In our case, I'm going to put this inside of a source folder. And in here, I'm going to create a folder called drizzle. Again, this is entirely optional how you set it up, but you need to make sure you put a path to it. So in our case, I'll have a schema.ts file directly inside of here. So my schema path is going to be inside that source folder, inside that drizzle folder, and it's called schema.ts. You can put the file wherever you want. This is just what I'm doing for the tutorial. Then we need to have an out option for where our migration files are going to be put. I'm going to be putting them essentially the exact same place, but I'm going to put them in a folder called migrations. There we go. So now whenever I do a database migration, the migrations are going to be generated inside this drizzle migrations folder for us. The next thing that we want to have after that is the driver. This is going to be the database you're using. In our case, we're using a Postgres database. So I'm going to choose the option PG here, but depending on what database you choose, you're going to choose a different driver here. So now that we have that set up, the next thing we need to do is set up our database credentials and we can just set our connection string. That's going to be coming from our process.environment.database URL. And we're going to make sure we cast that to a string just so TypeScript knows that this can work. So now we have our database URL being passed along. And finally, we have two more options that I recommend enabling. The first is going to be verbose. If we set that to true, essentially when we generate our migrations, it'll tell us exactly the things that are going to be changing. And then I recommend enabling strict as true as well, because that way, when you try to run a migration, if it needs to cause certain changes to your database, like you have default values that are not going to be set or things like that, or it's going to delete some tables, this will make sure it asks you, hey, you're going to be changing these things. Are you sure you actually want to run this? It's just a slight security measure. Both of these there, just make sure you don't accidentally do something incorrect. Now, once we have that done, the next step is to work on our schema. And I'm just going to make this full screen so it's a little bit easier to see what we're working on. So over in our schema here, what we want to do is we want to export constant variables for each one of our tables. Everything in this schema must be exported out of it. So we can say export const, and we're going to have a user table, call it whatever you want, however you want, it really doesn't matter. But then what we need to do is to create that table. And depending on which driver you're using, it'll be a different function. So in our case, we're going to come up here with an import, and we're going to get this from drizzle ORM. And you'll notice if I put a slash inside of here, there's a bunch of different options for all the different databases that you can use. In our case, we're using Postgres. So I'm going to use the PG dash core. This is saying coming from the Postgres core. If you were, for example, working with MySQL, you'll see that there is a MySQL core option, or if you're inside of SQLite, there's a SQLite core. So depending on what you're using, you want to make sure you use that core library. And inside of here, we get a bunch of different functions. Since we're in Postgres, ours is going to be called Postgres table, PG table. If you're in MySQL, it'll be a MySQL table and so on. So to create that new table, we can say PG table. And now inside of here, we need to pass it our table name. So let's just call this our user table. Doesn't really matter what we call it. And then we can come in here with all the different columns that we want to define. So let's say that we wanted to give this table an ID column. Well, we come in here with an ID as the key for that object. And then we would say that we wanted to create that column. Now, depending on what type you want to give that, you can import that directly from here. So for example, we can use a UUID type since we're in Postgres. We could use a var char. We could use an integer if we wanted to have a, like a string that or an integer that increments upwards. In our case, we're going to use UUID. So I can come in here and call that UUID function and give my column a name. In my case, I'll call it ID. In most cases, this key and this name are going to be pretty much the exact same value. Then we can specify different configuration options. As you can see here, I can specify different defaults, whether or not this is an array, if I want to have a random value by default, if it's a primary key. So I can say, you know what, this is our primary key for our database. And I can say that I want it to be a random value by default. Now, this is something that's only available for my UUIDs because it gives me a random UUID by default. Now, if I wanted to have an auto incrementing ID that was a number, I could do something like this instead. So I'll just call this ID2. This one is going to be an integer, which again, we want to get from that PG core library. So we're going to call this ID2, just like that. And if we want to make this auto increment, instead of using integer, we're actually going to replace this with serial instead. And serial works just like integer, but it's going to be automatically incremented for us. Then we would need to make sure that this is obviously a primary key, just like that. And this is how we would create an auto incrementing ID if we didn't want to use UUIDs, but I prefer UUIDs, so we're going to leave it like that. 
Now, the next thing I want to add in here is a name. And you may notice that in some libraries, you would use like a string, for example, as the type. But inside of Drizzle, everything maps almost one to one to database values. So instead of a string, you would use a var char because in a database, that is what you call a string. So we can come in here with our var char just like that. And we can say that our var char is going to have a name of name. And we can specify that it must be required so it is not null. And we can even specify other things like how long this var char will be. So our length, for example, we can specify as 255. We can do all these extra customizations that most other database ORMs do not let you do. Now, before we start diving into the weeds of everything you can do inside of schemas, I first wanna get us set up with the simplest version of a database before we start going into the complex stuff. So here we have a very simple schema for a single table, and now I want to do a migration for that. One side of Drizzle, this is incredibly easy. Once you have your config file set up like this and your schema set up, you can do your migrations just by running NPX. It's gonna be Drizzle kit, and it's called generate, and we just need to specify what our driver is. So in our case, we're using Postgres, so it's gonna be colon PG. Now, if we hit enter, it's going to generate a migration file for us that has everything we need. So if we go over into our migrations folder, you'll notice directly inside of here, we have a migration file that says create table if not exist user, and it gives us all the different stuff that we need that we've specified inside of our schema. Now, if we want to remove this migration for some particular reason, what you would need to do is just say that you want to drop. So we could say drizzle kit drop just like that. And that's going to completely delete that migration. So we're going to choose that migration. And now you can see it's been deleted. Obviously, we don't want to do that. So let's regenerate that migration for us. So now we have that inside of our migration folder. And generally, what I would recommend doing is adding these to your actual script here. So I could say like db generate is going to call drizzle kit and it's gonna be calling generate PG just like that. Now I can just run NPM run DB generate and it's going to do that exact same thing. I just need to make sure I save this file before I try to run it and you'll see now it'll run it and obviously there's no changes so there's no migration file that's been created. Now at this point, all we've done is create a migration file but we haven't actually ran this against our database. I mean, we don't even have a database URL yet. So what we need to do next is create a file that lets us apply these migrations. And this is where the actual documentation comes really in handy because this is essentially the code you want to do. You'll want to make sure you essentially copy this directly into your file. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new file called migrate.ts. doesn't really matter what you call it. This is just the code we're going to run to migrate our database. So what we need to do first of all inside of here is to load our environment variables. So I'm going to import dot env slash config. That's going to load our environment variables that are inside of here. This may be an optional step depending on how your environment variables are set up. Then we want to make sure that we import all of these different files right here. So I'm just going to copy over these imports directly from the documentation. And again, depending on which driver you use, it'll be slightly different import steps. Then down here, you'll notice that we have this code. I'm just going to copy this over so we can see what it looks like and we'll paste it down into here. Essentially, we need to pass our database URL to here. So process dot env dot database URL as a string. And then it's saying that we should be using a max of one here. And essentially that's just being listed right here for migration. Make sure you set a max of one. That's exactly from the documentation. So then the next step is just to run the migrate. So we can migrate it using this migrate function, which comes from Drizzle by passing in our client into here. And all we want to do is pass in where our migration folders are. So we can say migration folder, and we can specify the path to that, which is dot slash source slash drizzle slash migrations. There we go. And now all we need to do is make sure we await this happening because this is going to be a command that we must await. So the best way to do that is to create a function, make sure it's asynchronous. We'll call it main just like that. We don't actually need to return anything in here. We'll just await that right there, call that main function. And then we can make sure that we close our migrate client. So migration client dot end is going to close this and we can await that as well. Now, no matter which driver you use, this file is going to look almost exactly the same. You're going to have your imports, which are going to be dependent upon your driver, in our case, Postgres.js. Then you're going to create a brand new migration client. That's going to be essentially the code you copy directly from here. And then finally, you're going to call the migrate function, passing in your client and passing in the path to the folder. And then you're going to close out of your client to end any connection. That's all you need to do to set this up. So now the last step is just to add our database URL. You can host your database wherever you want. I'm just gonna be running a local Postgres version. So as you can see here, I have PostgreSQL. My username is Postgres, my password is password. It's running locally. And the name of this database is Drizzle Crash Course, which I've already created before this video. But again, you can host this wherever you want, whatever your URL is, just paste it directly into here. Once that's done, now we can actually run this migrate file. And all you need to run it is with TSX. So we're gonna just inside of here, create a really handy little db migrate helper. And this is just gonna say TSX and it's gonna run that migrate file. So it's source slash drizzle 
slash migrate.ts. So now if we come in here, npm run db migrate, it should apply that migration to our actual database. As you can see, it ran without any errors, so we should be good to go. So in order to test, there's essentially two different things we can do. First of all, we could open up Drizzle Studio, which is just a way to view our database inside of our browser really easily. So I can show you how to set that up real quick. It's really easy. All you need to do is essentially run the command Drizzle Studio. So we can say npx Drizzle Kit Studio, just like that, that's going to open up a Studio version for us. It looks like we need to install a package though for that. So we'll just install that PG package. Once that's installed, we should hopefully be able to view this in the Studio version. So you can see it looks like it's running. If I open that up on the side, you can see that I can see my user table with an ID name and it has no data inside of it. You can see if I zoom that in. Now you can change this around all you want. It has a bunch of different functionality. I'm not gonna go over this, but this is a really great way to be able to interact with everything that's inside of your database from a more UI based approach. So now essentially let's go back to the Drizzle kit documentation. Actually Drizzle ORM is going to be fine. And I'm just gonna full screen our code on the left-hand side because the next step is going to be connecting to our database. We've ran our migration, so everything's applied to our database. Now we need to connect to it. So in order to do that, I'm gonna create a really simple db.ts file. And inside of here, I'm going to connect to my database. So what I wanna do is I wanna get Drizzle, which is the way we connect. I wanna get that from the specific dri driver. So we have Drizzle ORM and we're using the Postgres.js. So I'm gonna be getting that directly from there. Then we need to get our schema that we're going to be using. So I can import star as schema from that schema file, which in our case is dot slash schema. This is why we needed to make sure we exported everything from here so that we can import it up here to use inside of our database when we do our connection. Then we need to get our actual driver, which is Postgres from that Postgres library. Now we can get our database client by just saying Postgres and calling process.env.database URL as a string. You may notice this looks familiar because essentially it's the exact same line that we did up here. And if we actually look at the documentation specifically for this Postgres section, if we scroll down here, you can see that this is the line right here that we're essentially copying. So if you want, you can directly copy this line or you can just show it right out when I'm writing inside of my code. So now let's make this full screen real quick. There we go. Go back over to that DB file. We have our client. Now all we need to do is export a constant variable called DB, which is just gonna be equal to calling drizzle passing in our client, passing in our schema so it knows what all of our types are gonna be. And I'm also gonna pass in a logger of true, and that's because it's going to log out all the SQL queries we make, so it'll be really easy to see exactly what's happening inside of our database, inside of our console. So now that we have that done, we have access to our database anywhere inside of our project. So now in this main file, I could just import our database up here. So I could say import db from that db file, and now I can interact with my database however I want. As you can see, if I do db dot, I have a bunch of different things I can do with my database. For example, inserting some new data. So I'm not gonna deep dive into how insert works yet. We're gonna get to that later, but I just wanna show you how inserting and querying data works so we can see that this is all hooked up properly. So to insert data, we first need to specify the table we want. And since we exported this information from our schema, we can just import the name of our table just like that. And then we can specify the values that we want to import. In our case, we want to specify the name of Kyle. That's going to allow us to create a brand new user. And if we just await that, that'll actually create a user for us. And then we can query that by saying query on the user table. We want to find the first user just like that. And let's await that. There we go. We'll say const user is equal to that. And I'll just console.log our user out just like that. So now if I just say npm, whoops, npm run dev, that should run our project right here. And of course we're getting an error. And the reason for that is because we're not loading our environment variables. So all the way up here, if we just import .env slash config, that'll load our environment variables. And now you can see we ran a query that inserted into the user table, a new user with the name of Kyle, and we selected that user from the table and you can see it's being printed out right here. So these two lines that actually show the query being printed out, that's just because inside of here, we specified logger of true. And then this final line is just the actual data being returned right here from our console log. Now that we've kind of gone through the basics of everything you need to actually get hooked up with your database, I wanna jump back into the schema section. I wanna talk about everything there is to know about the schema so we can actually set up everything inside of here that we need to do. So first I wanna create a rather complex schema that pretty much covers everything you need to know about Drizzle and all the different features it has. So for our user table, let's add a few more things. For example, let's add an age into here and this age is going to be an integer. So we're gonna have an integer just like that. And we're gonna call this column age. 
There we go. And then we can specify other fields we want to know about this. First of all, let's make sure we import integer, make sure we get it from the right library. There we go. And now we can specify that this is not going to be a null value. So we'll say not null. And we could specify some other things, but in our case, that's going to be perfectly fine. Then let's specify an email. This email is going to be a varchar. So let's use that varchar function of email. And again, we'll specify a length of 255, just so we can minimize how much space this takes up. We'll make sure it's not null. And let's go ahead and make it unique as well. And this is just going to be so that every single user has a unique email instead of two users having the same email. Now, the final thing I want to specify is a role, which essentially is going to be an enum of two different values, either basic or admin. So we're going to come in here and we want to specify a role. And to use an enum, we actually need to create an enum up above. So let's make sure we export this. Again, you must export every single thing inside of this file if you want it to be created in your database. And we'll call this PG enum, just like that. Well, first of all, we should call it our user role. And then we'll call the function PG enum. And again, the reason it starts with PG is because we're using Postgres. MySQL would start with MySQL and so on. So here, we're going to give it a name of user role. And then we're going to specify our values as admin and basic, just like that. So now this role down here can just use that user role, and then we can specify everything we want inside of it. So we're going to call this as a function, pass it in a name, and then we can say that we want the default value for this to be basic. We can also specify that this cannot be null, just like that. So now we've essentially created a brand new user table. But what if we want to specify certain things that are going to be across the entire table? Like if we wanted to create an index on our email field to make it a little bit quicker for us to query. Well, then that's where we can pass in a second value to PG table. And the second value takes in my table. So in our case, it takes in our user table right here. And then what we need to do is return from this an object that contains all the different things we want. So for example, if I want to have an email index, I could come in here just like this on my table. I could specify the email field if I wanted to. And in my case, I want to create an index. So I could use the index function. So let me make sure I get that index function just like that. I could pass it in what the name of this is going to be, email index. And then I can say I want to specify that on this email field. So now I've just created an index on my email field to make querying a little bit faster. And if I wanted, I could actually specify this as a unique index and I could remove my unique constraint from up here. So now it's going to be unique and indexed for extra speed. I also have the option to make multiple fields unique. So let's say that every single user must have a unique name and age combination. Well, I could come in here and I could say unique name and age is just going to be calling a unique function just like this. I'm going to say that this is going to be unique name and age. And I can specify that that's going to be on and pass it in the different fields. So in my case, my name and my age. So now every single user must have a unique name and age. Otherwise, we're going to get an error. Obviously, you wouldn't want this in a real project, but this is just for demonstration purposes. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how you have different references between multiple tables for things like foreign keys. And we're going to start with a one to one reference. So let's say that users can have user preferences, but they're going to be in their own table. So let's export a constant. This is going to be called user preferences table, and that's going to be equal to PG table. We're going to call this user preferences, just like that. There we go. So now we can specify all of our columns. So we're going to have an ID column, which is going to be exactly the same as the ID column up here. I'll just copy it over exactly. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have like an email updates column. This is going to be true or false, depending on if they want email updates. So it's going to be a Boolean value. We can give this a name of email updates, just like that. We can specify that this is not going to be null, and we can even give it a default value of false, for example. Now, since we want this table to be able to reference our user table up here, we need to give it a user ID. And this user ID is going to be a UUID called user ID. And the really important thing here is we want to specify that it references this table up here. So references is just going to essentially take inside of it the thing we want to reference. So we want to reference the user table ID. So we're saying that this user ID column on our user preferences table is a reference to our ID column in our user table. That's essentially what this one line does here. So we just return whatever the thing is that we're trying to reference. Doing this actually sets up a foreign key between these two different tables. So now this user ID essentially points to this user table and it creates that foreign key relationship for us. We can also specify down here that this is not allowed to be null because obviously this cannot be null. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is going to be a one to many relationship and that is going, going to be using a post table. So I'm going to say post table, just like that, PG table, post. 
And essentially a post table is going to be different posts that users can create like blog articles and one user can create many different posts. So this is going to be that one to many relationship I was talking about. So the first thing we need on site here is going to be an ID and also it's going to have a title. So I'm just going to copy down this name because it's essentially the same thing. You can see here it's a not an old title just like that. Now the next thing we're going to have is an average rating and this is going to be a rating between zero and five and it could be a decimal number so you may think that we need to use like a float or something like that but that's not a type that's inside of postgres as you can see mysql has that but postgres does not instead we need to use what's called a real this is again because all of these different columns are based on what the actual database data type is that's why we're using this real column here so this is going to be an average rating just like that i'm going to specify that this is not null and I'm gonna give it a default value of zero just to get started with. Now we're also going to specify some created at and updated at fields. So we're gonna say created at is going to be a timestamp, again, coming from Postgres. This is created at. We're gonna make sure that this defaults to the now current value, and it's also going to be not null. Now I'm gonna copy that down because I'm gonna do the exact same thing, but for updated at, just like that, and this is gonna be called updated at, and the default time is gonna be now. Now, since every single post needs to have an author, let's specify an author ID, which is going to point back to this user table right here. And this is going to work just like this user ID here. So we're gonna have a UUID, we're gonna call it author ID, just like that. And it's going to specifically reference that table. So it's gonna reference the user table dot ID, and again, we're gonna make sure that this is not null because every single post must have an author. So as you can see, doing a one-to-one -one and a one-to-many relationship in our schema is pretty much exactly the same. And the next thing I wanna talk about is going to be a many-to-many -many relationship. So let's say that each post is going to have a category and each category is going to have a post, but obviously one post can have multiple categories and each category can have multiple posts associated with it. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship. So to get started, let's create our category table just like that, that's PG table. And that's just called category, just like that. And this category is very straightforward. We're essentially just gonna have an ID and a name. So I'm gonna copy this in here. I'm gonna replace this with title. So it's gonna say name instead. So each one of our categories has an ID and it's going to have a name and nothing else. And now we need a way to link these together. And we're gonna be using what's essentially called a join table inside of SQL. So we're gonna create a brand new table that hooks together our category and our post. So this is gonna be a table export const this is going to be our product or sorry our post category table that's going to be a pg table we can just call it post category just like that and inside of here we need to return all the different columns we want well obviously we're going to have a post id which is going to be a uuid just like that post id and it's going to reference our post table so we're going to say post table dot id there we go we're going to do essentially the exact same thing with our category id so category ID, category ID, and it's gonna reference our category table, just like that, the ID column. I also want to make sure that these are not null, so I'm gonna specify not null on both of these. And now you may think, okay, let's add an ID column to this as well. So we'll add an ID like this. But for this particular table, we don't need a unique ID because we know that every single combination of post and category is going to be unique and can actually act as our primary key. So we can use what's called a composite primary key. And to set up a primary key that uses multiple columns inside of Drizzle is incredibly easy. We just come in here and pass in the second parameter, which takes in our table, just like that. We're gonna return a new object here, and this is gonna be called our primary key. We'll just say P key, doesn't matter what the actual name is, but now we can call the primary key function just like this. This primary key function is going to take in what the columns for our primary key are, which in our case is going to be our post ID and our category ID. So now we've created a composite primary key using these two different IDs right here. So if you want, you can have your primary key on an individual column or using a composite column just like this. Now this is essentially the entire schema we're gonna be using for the rest of this project, but there's a few other things I wanna talk about that I haven't mentioned yet. First of all, I briefly mentioned this array function. Essentially, you can use that to say that this is now going to be an array of numbers instead of just a normal number. We can also specify inside of here some other things such as dollar sign $type and dollar sign $default. Dollar sign type allows us to overwrite the type of this particular object. So what I can do is I can specify my type inside of here. For example, let's say I want this number to only be either 12 or 24. Now the age must be either the value of 12 or 24 because I overrode that type. You can override any type that you want using this and it's really useful for things like JSON columns. For example, if one of these columns was a bunch of JSON data, I may wanna specify the type of what that JSON data actually represents. 
We can also use dollar sign default, and this allows us to pass a function that is essentially going to run every time I try to insert of information into my database, and it's going to get the default value. So we could say like math.random, for example, and that's going to give me a completely random number every single time that I run my database to set as that default value. So this is a way that you can actually run code every single time you insert to get a new default value. Now, the last kind of schema thing I want to talk about is on this references function, you can actually pass it a second object, which determines what happens when you delete or update this. For example, if I delete this specific thing, what do I want to do? And this is just going to be a string. So we can come in here, paste in our string. We can do like a cascade, no action restrict, set a default or set null. I can do the exact same thing for on update. So that just gives you a little bit of extra customization of what you want to happen. So now that we have our schema done, let's go ahead and actually try to migrate this. So we can say npm run db generate to generate our migration, and that's going to run. And as you can see, since we're using verbose, it actually lists out every single thing that's going to be changing inside of here. Then we can run db migrate just like this to actually migrate our database. Now you will notice we're going to get an error, and that's because we have some default data inside of here. Column age of relation user contains a null value. We have data and we didn't specify these default values. Now for our particular use case, since we're essentially overhauling our entire database, what I'm going to do is just delete the user that we currently have in the database. So I'm going to go over to my main file here. I'm going to say db.delete. I'm going to delete from that user table. And that's it. I'm just going to delete literally every single user inside of our table. So now what I can do is I can npm run dev to actually delete those users. And there we go. Now what I can do is run migrate and that should work because there's no longer any data. And it looks like everything worked. It's just telling us essentially certain things are already created. So it's skipping it, which is perfectly fine. So now we have our new migration set up. So our entire database is set up with all that information. Now with all that done, we can talk about all the different ways you can interact with your database, whether it's creating data, reading data, updating data, or deleting data. And we're gonna get started with creating data first because it's actually relatively straightforward. Inside of Drizzle, there's only one function you can use to insert data, and that is the insert function just like this. So we need to specify the table we want to insert into, which is our user table. We could also do like the post table if we wanted or so on. We'll just say that we want to insert a brand new user. Then you need to specify the values as the very next thing. And if you're used to writing your code in SQL, you may notice that this actually reads a lot like SQL. So for example, we're inserting into the user table the values of the following. So if we want to insert one single thing, we just are going to add in an object here of what we actually want to insert. So if we look here, you can see we can specify age, email, name, ID, and role. In our case, let's just say the name is going to be Kyle. We're going to come in here with an age of 29. And then we're going to specify the email as test at test.com. That is allowing us to create a brand new user. They'll have the basic role by default, and they're going to have a randomly generated ID. So we can say const user is equal to awaiting that. But you will notice something a little bit interesting. If I hover over the type of this user, you can see it's an array of never values. And that's because this insert query by default returns absolutely nothing to you. If you want to return data about the thing you just created, you need to specify this returning option. And this returning option essentially takes an object that you pass in that'll determine what you want to return. So if we want to return the ID, we could specify a field called ID, and then we need to say what that ID maps to. So we would say it is our user table dot ID. So now we're saying we have a key called ID that maps to this user table ID. And now you can see that this is returning to us an array of objects with an ID and a string. And the reason that this is returning an array is because this insert function can be used to insert one value or multiple values. Right now we're inserting one value. And if I were to save this and I actually run our code, so we come in here, we say npm run dev just like that hit enter, you can see it's running up and you can see we've inserted into that user table this information and it's returned to us all these different parameters. And if we were to console log our user, we would get essentially the ID back for it. So what I can do inside of here is I can say console.log user. And of course this is going to fail if I try to run this again, because essentially I'm trying to add a new user with an email that already exists. So beforehand, I'll just make sure we delete all of our users every single time. So delete from the user table. There we go. So now if I give that a quick save, you can see it returns to us an array with that single ID. And again, the reason it returns an array is because you can insert multiple values if you want. If you want to create multiple users, just pass an array here instead. So now what we're going to do is pass in essentially a second object, which is going to have a name of Sally. We'll say the age is going to be 25. And we're going to give them an email here of test 
at test2.com, just so it's a different email. And now you can see we get two different IDs being returned back in that array for both of these different users that we've created. Now, the really important thing to note about Drizzle is essentially when you're trying to determine what columns or data you want to get back, you're always going to be passing it in this style of syntax, where you pass it an object and you can specify the name of the thing you want to be returned and then what that maps to. For example, I could call this anything I wanted to, and you'll notice when I save, it's called whatever I want it to be, but it's still getting it from that ID column. Generally, these two things are gonna have probably the same name, but it's nice that you can change the name of what you want it to be. For example, if I wanted to get the user name, I could just say user table dot name, just like that. And now I'm getting both this username and the ID being returned back to me. And you can specify whatever you want inside of here. Now, another thing that you can do is if you want to have essentially an upsert command, which either you're gonna do an insert or an update, you can come in here and say on conflict, do nothing or do update. And this is again, something only available in Postgres and in SQLite. There's a command called on duplicate key update that's going to do the same thing in MySQL. But essentially inside of here, we can specify exactly what we want. For example, we can specify the target, which is the thing that we essentially want to compare against. So we'll say user table dot email, just like that. So if the email is going to be the same, instead of inserting, we're going to be doing an update. And this update is going to set some specific fields. So essentially we're gonna set the name to updated name. We don't have to specify this set field if we don't want to, but we're going to. And if we really wanted, we could specify a where clause, but we're gonna leave that off for now. So now essentially, if we try to insert a user with this test at test.com email, essentially an email that already exists, it's going to do this on conflict do update instead. And it's gonna change your name to updated name. So what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna delete my users. I'm gonna run save on this. And now you'll notice something interesting. Essentially, it's trying to insert both of these users, but you'll notice that what's happening is both of them already have emails that are in our database. So what it's doing is it's inserting all of this data and it's going to be updating everything, but it's going to replace their name with whatever this name is. Now that's literally everything there is to inserting users into a database with Drizzle. It's a relatively simple process. Now, when it comes to selecting users from a database, there's two different ways that you can do it. And I'll show you both of them real quick. So the very first thing that we can do inside of here is we could say await, let me make sure I delete all this code that we no longer need. There we go. db.query. And that allows us to use more of a Prisma-like syntax for querying things. It's more of a higher level syntax. Or you can use select, and that's essentially going to allow you to do more of a raw SQL style of selecting. So first of all, let's just do query, because this is the thing that's maybe a little bit easier to understand. You specify your table. So let's say user table, because that's the table we have information inside of. And what I want to do is I want to select specific information from here. So we'll say user table dot, and we can specify we want to find just one thing or if we want to find many. So let's find many different users. And you'll notice inside of here, I have a bunch of different things I can pass in. The first one is going to be all the different columns I want to select. If I leave this blank, it's going to select all the columns. But in my case, let's say I want to select just the email. So I could say email true, and now it's going to give me back all the users' emails. So if I say const users is equal to that, there we go and I console.log our users, give that a quick save and we look at our console, you can see I get an array with both the different emails from our table. I could also come in here and get the name if I wanted, set that to true. And now you can see it gives me the email and the name of all the users. Or if I wanted to get every field except for the email, I could say email false, and now it returns to me every single thing except for the user's email. So columns is relatively straightforward. Let's just specify inside of here, we're gonna have name of true. So it's just gonna give us back the name of our two different users. Now, the next thing we can look at is this extra section. Now, extras is a little bit interesting because it actually allows you to run raw SQL to return extra information that you maybe wouldn't be able to get with just this very simple syntax. So here you pass it an object. Let's say I wanted to get lowercase name. And I could specify that that is going to be running this SQL function directly from our Drizzle ORM. And the SQL function takes in a template string that we want to run. So for example, I could get a lowercase version of calling that template function. So here I could get my user table dot name, just like that. And this is gonna be a lowercase version of it. And I can even specify that this is going to return to me a string. The only last thing we need to specify is a name for this column. So we can just come in here and say as, and specify the name, which will say lowercase name. Now, if I give that a quick save, you can see it's returning to me the lowercase version of my name. And this allows me to run raw SQL. Now, this is a lot to cover, so I'm gonna kind of break down exactly what's happening in this extra section. Essentially, it's just a key value pair where the key is the name of the thing you want to actually get, so in our case, lowercase name, and the value is going to be some raw SQL. And if you wanna run raw SQL inside of Drizzle, you're gonna use this SQL function. And the SQL function is a generic, so you can actually pass the type of the thing it's going to return, and then you can pass in whatever your normal SQL is going to be. And the really great thing is, is if you need to reference a column name or something like that, you can just get it directly from here, like user table.name is gonna give me the name of that column. 
As you can see, if we look at the query, it's actually selecting lower name and it replaced this entire section with this you know, quotation mark name, quotation mark, just like that. And it even gave it the as name that we specified here. Now, unfortunately, this as name is actually required. That's why we're getting an error without it. So we just need to make sure we specify that inside of there. So this SQL thing is really fancy and really nice if you want to do custom SQL that's beyond anything that you can do inside of your normal SQL queries. Now, luckily, everything else we're going to look at is quite a bit simpler than this. So let's go ahead and we'll get rid of that extra section and we'll look a little bit further. We can specify the limit. For example, I want to get just one thing and it's going to return to me one instead of multiple. And I could also say offset inside of here, offset by one. And that's essentially just going to offset me by one. So it's going to skip the very first element, for example. If I have my offset zero, you can see we get both. And by offsetting by one, we only get one. And if I offset by two, we get nothing because there's nothing after the second element. Now we can take this a little bit further, come into here, and you can see that we have order by and where and width. Now, first I'm gonna talk about width because that is going to require us to make some changes. So width allows you to essentially select different relationships. So you may notice that our users have user preferences and they have post. Well, if we come into this width, there's actually nothing that's going to be working inside of here. The reason for that is because Drizzle doesn't actually know that we have these references set up. So if I said I wanted to get the post by saying post true and giving this a save, I'm gonna get a bunch of different errors inside of here. So in order to let Drizzle know that my user actually has post, we need to go back into our schema. And right now we've set it up on the database level. This references right here sets up a database level reference, but we want to set up essentially a drizzle level reference for us to use. So all the way at the bottom here, I'm gonna put this inside of a section that's labeled relations, just so I know that this is going to be specifically just for relationship mapping. And this is where you can actually specify the relationships for each table you have. So for each individual table with relationships, we're gonna export a constant variable. This is gonna be our user table relations, just like that. And it's gonna be equal to calling this relations function. And this relations function takes in the table you want to specify your relationships on, and it's going to give you a function. And this function is going to give you two different things. It's going to give you a one and a many function that you can use. And then if we come down here a little further, we can return an object from here that specifies all the different relationships that we have. For example, our user we know has one preference. So we can say preferences, it doesn't matter what you call this, you just call it whatever you want it to be labeled as. And we're gonna say that this is going to be a one mapping. So we can say it has one preference and that preference is to our user preference table. So we're saying our user table has one user preference from the user preferences table. Now we can also come in here and say it's going to have multiple post and that's going to be using this many function. So we can say it's gonna have many from the post table. So this little bit of code right here essentially sets up those relationships for us. And actually just going back into our main file here, now if we specify inside of here, you'll notice we have post and preferences. So I could say post is true. And now when I run my code and I look inside here, I'll just close this out and rerun it to see if it should work. It looks like it's not quite working. And if we look at the error, it's because there's just not enough information currently to infer this. And that's because we've only set up our relationship on one side of the schema. We've set it up on our users, but we haven't set it up on our post yet. So what we need to do is do the exact same thing for our post and our preferences. So let's start with our user preferences relations. There we go. Make sure it's table relations. There we go. And we're going to call that relations function. And it's going to pass in our user preferences table. And again, this is going to be getting in that function. And in our case, we only care about the one to one mappings. So now we can return from here an object that maps to our user. And we can say this is going to have one user from our user table. And when you're doing a one to one mapping, the table that has the ID, in our case, this user preferences table has our user ID inside of it. If we scroll up here. That's the table you need to actually pass in a second parameter for to set up all this mapping. So here you need to specify the fields. In our case, the field is going to be our user preferences table by user ID. So this is essentially your foreign key. And then we need to specify the thing it references. So this is gonna be your references and it references the user table ID. So whenever you do a one-to-one -one mapping, whichever one has the field mapping to the other table, you need to specify the fields, which is that field mapping, and then you need to specify the references, which is the table it actually references. Now this at least gives us a mapping between our preferences and our user. So now if we change this to preferences, it should actually work. As you can see here, it's doing the query, it's setting up all of our different join table, table data that it needs, and you can see we're getting null back as our preferences because we haven't saved any user preferences yet. Now, if we were to actually save a user preference by just coming in here, db.insert user preferences table, let's specify a value here. And this value that we want to specify is going to have email updates. Let's set that to true. And it's going to have a user ID. Let's, let's just comment this out for now and actually select our ID for our user. 
ID is true, just so we can copy one of these IDs. So I'm just gonna copy this ID right here and we're gonna paste it up into here. So now we're gonna run this statement just like that. That's going to insert a brand new user preferences for that particular user ID. I'm gonna give that a save. We can remove this line since we no longer need it. And if we look at our code, you'll notice here, user preferences is null, while this one is getting all the different data we need for our user preferences. And if we want, we can specify just the email updates by coming in here and we could say that we wanna get some columns and the columns we wanna get is email updates. So now it's getting just the email updates section from there. Now, in order to make sure all the rest of our querying works, we should go back into our schema and actually set up our schemas for our post and our categories and so on. So we're gonna say export const post table relations. And that's gonna be calling that relations function with our post table. And this one is going to have both a one and a many relationship. There we go. So let's run that function real quick. And here we're gonna have an author, which is going to be based on that author ID. So that's a one relationship and make sure I return this as an object. There we go. A one relationship. This one relationship is gonna be on our post. I'm sorry, not our post, our user table. There we go. And whenever you have a one to many relationship, whichever side of the relationship is the one needs to specify the extra fields. So here we're gonna specify our fields, which is just post table dot author ID. That's essentially the thing we're referencing or the thing we're using to reference the other table. And the references is just the table we want to reference, which is our user table dot ID. So now we've set up that relationship. The next thing we need to specify is the post categories. So our post categories, there we go. That's gonna be a many relationship through our post category table. And again, if we're doing a many side of the relationship, we don't have to specify those extra fields. Now, the last two tables we have to set up are our categories and our post categories. I'm gonna paste this in because we've already done this before. As you can see, each category table has many posts and it should actually say post categories here. So let me just fix that. That should be post categories. And this is our post category table, just like that. So every category has multiple post categories. And then inside of our post category table, they have exactly one post and exactly one category. And we're just setting up all of our different fields and references and so on. And now if we save that, everything will be working. And you may have noticed that in all the time we were messing with these relations, I never actually did any database migrations. And that's because all of these relations don't actually change our underlying database. This is purely for Drizzle when we're doing a query style mutation or query style thing. So when we're doing db.query, that's the only time these relations are actually being used. So the nice thing about this is I can make it as complex as I want. For example, I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna say I wanna get post. So we're gonna say post just like that. And inside of this post section, I also want to specify that I'm going to be getting the post categories of true. So now if I give that a little bit of a save and I look at my information, you can notice right now it's just returning me an empty array of posts. But if I had a post for users, it would also return to me the information about the post categories and so on. And I can get as complicated and as nested as I want with all of this different information. So that covers what this with section does. The last two sections are order by and where. And you'll notice these order by, where, and extras actually have two different ways you can call them. That's because there's a function version and a non-function version. And I'll show you how both of them work by starting with order by. So order by is really straightforward. It allows you to just order things however you want. For example, if we wanted to sort these people by name, we could say ASSC for ascending. We're gonna import that from Drizzle ORM. And then we could say we want to specify the column, which is our user table dot name. So it's going to be ascending based on the name. So now if we give that a save, you can see right now our names are exactly the same, but if we were to do like age, for example, so we're gonna specify this as age and get the age, you can now notice it's sorting 25 to 29. And if we change this to descending instead, you can see 29 shows up first and 25 shows up second. So that's how we do order by relatively straightforward. The function version of order by is a little bit different. So we're gonna be getting two different values. We're gonna be getting the table that we want as well as all the different functions that we can call. I'll just call this funks for now. And then we can return whatever we want from inside of here. So we could say funks.ascending, descending, or use that SQL function. For example, we can just do ascending, and then we can say table dot, and we can get the age from here, for example. So now you can see it's sorting by the actual age. And generally, I would break this out to something like this. So I would say ascending, and then just call the function directly like that. So it's a little bit more concise and easy to read. So either way that you want to write this is going to work just fine, and where is going to work exactly the same. So let's come in here with where. It's gonna be our table, as well as all of the different functions that we can use. So we can come in here and return whatever we want. So we could say, for example, funks. And as you can see, we have tons of different selectors we can use. So for example, I could say wherever the table dot age is equal to 29. So now it's only going to determine people with the age exactly of 29. 
or I could use this between function and it's gonna get me people that have an age between 20 and 25. There we go, give that a save. And you can see it returns just this user because their age is between zero and 25. Now I'm not gonna cover what every single one of these different functions does because for the most part, they're pretty self-explanatory such as and, between, equals, exist, and so on. And they pretty much map one-to-one -to, -one to everything you could do inside of a database. So if you've ever worked with a database where queries before, that's essentially what these queries are doing exactly here. And you could even use this SQL if you wanted to write your own custom raw SQL where query. For example, checking if the age is greater than 25 or something like that. For the most part, I wouldn't use this SQL unless you actually have to. For example, there's a greater than function you could use if you wanted to do greater than checking. But if you had something that couldn't be done by these normal functions, I would recommend using that SQL function to write your own custom SQL. Now that right there covers everything you need to know about the query way of doing things, which again is very similar to something like you're going to be using Prisma or other ORMs. Now, if you want to do a little bit more of a raw query style for like SQL querying, you could use select instead. And you can see we have different things like select distinct. We're just going to focus on select. So first of all, we say select, and then we say from whatever table we want. So we're going to use the user table just like that. So again, very similar to normal SQL, select from table, and then we can come in here and we can specify the different columns that we want to get. So to specify the columns, you put them inside this select section right here, and you can just say, I want to get the ID as user table dot ID. And this is very similar to how we were inserting data and other things related to getting data, like when we were doing returning, we specify the name we want, as well as the thing that it actually maps to. And now you can see we're getting both the different user IDs being passed out to us. Now, if we wanted to do different things on top of this, this is where the dot syntax comes into here. So for example, we can come in here and do like a dot where, and this dot where works exactly the same as the where we had before. For example, I could say equal, make sure that I import this equal function so I can actually use it. And I could say user table dot age, and 29. So now it's only going to get me the users where their age is 29. As you can see, if I actually select the age as user table dot age, you can see that it's getting me the user with that age of 29. So I can do all the things that I was able to do with my normal query, but essentially I'm writing them out a little bit more like SQL instead of using that more Prisma style syntax. I can also come in here and directly do different joins. For example, I could do a left join on the user preferences table. So to do a join, you specify what the table is, in my case, user preferences, and then we specify what type of thing we want to compare. For example, we're going to do an equal comparison where our user preferences user ID is equal to our user table dot ID. So in that case, now we're doing this extra join. Right now, the join is going to go through, but we're not selecting any data. So let's say that I wanted to get email updates, and we could just specify that as our user preferences .email updates. So now you can see that for each one of my users, I'm getting that email updates column as well. Now, if I make sure I remove this where clause so I get all my users, you can see this one, which has an email update set, is going to be true while this one down here is null because it does not have any user preferences set for that user. Now, just like with my normal query, I could also do things like get a specific limit. I could get a specific offset. I can do my order by, which again, works exactly the same, where I could say ascending and pass in whatever I want. It works just like the normal query version of it. And then also on top of that, I can come in here with a group by. So I can say that I want to group by a specific column. So we'll say user table dot name. And now it's going to group all my users by the name column inside that table. So we can come into here and let's say that we wanted to specify like getting the count of all the users with each individual name. So we're going to say count, which is using this count function directly from Drizzle. It's a nice helpy hander function. So we can say that we want to get the user table dot name. And we're also going to get the name like this. So user table dot name. So what this code right here is doing is it's grouping all my users by name, printing out the name, and printing out the number of users with each individual name. Now in our case, we have two users with the exact same name, so you can see my count is two. Now if I swap this to group by age instead, and I up here specify age as all these different parameters, now you can see I get a count of one for users with the age of 29, and a count of one for the users with the age of 25. So I'm able to do different counting and grouping and so on. And the nice thing is there's a bunch of different functions here. I can use count distinct, I could use the average function to get like an average of their different ages. I could use the distinct version as well. I could also get a sum of all the information or a distinct version. And they also have a maximum and a minimum function as well. Or if I really want, I can write my own custom SQL for a different thing that's not supported. Now, if I keep this as count, I could also come in here after my group by and I can specify a having as well. And for example, I could say, I want to only get the people that have greater than, let me make sure I import that. I want to get a user table. And actually, instead of getting a user table specifically, I want to get it where the count is greater than one. So to do that, I need to use the function version of this, which gives me all my columns. So I'm going to have my columns just like that. 
So now I can say that it's going to be equal, or not equal, greater than is what I decided I wanted. Columns.count is greater than one. So anytime that I have a count greater than one, then I'm going to select it. So right now I get nothing returned, but if I change this back to age, or not age, I change it to name, for example, instead, we know that we have two users with the same name, so my count is going to be greater than one. So as you can see, this is essentially just like writing out raw SQL, but the nice thing is we have really good type safety across all of this. For example, I get perfect type safety on my users and all the different columns I'm putting into my users. So if I were to like misspell something, you'll notice I get an error immediately telling me that that is misspelled, so it's really easy to fix. Now, the really nice thing is we've pretty much covered all the hard stuff because all we have left is updates and deletes, and they're very simple to do inside of Drizzle. So what we can do, if we just get rid of all of this, we can talk about updating. And for the update, this works almost identically to how you do an insert. So let's say we wanna update inside of our user table. We can come in here and specify set. So we use set instead of value. And we can say, you know what? I wanna set the age to 30. So whatever person I'm updating, I'm setting the age to 30. And then we can come in here and specify a where clause. So I can specify like my ID, for example, user table, dot ID is equal to whatever ID I want to use. In my case, I'm just going to use the age. So where the age is 29, I want to update the age to 30. And we can even specify a returning field to get the returning properties, just like we did with our inserts. So let's just run this code so it actually updates our user to set their age to 30. And now if we were to do a select of all of our users from our user table, just like that, and we make sure we log that out, we should see that now our user has an age of 30 instead of an age of 29. So we know that our update worked. So updates almost identical to how you do an insert, but you use set instead of values. And then finally, we have delete, which is really straightforward. We specify delete and the table we want to delete from. And then we can come in here with a where clause, for example, where are my user dot age, sorry, user table dot age is equal to 30. So now I'm going to delete the user with the age equal to 30. And again, I can specify any different returning properties that I wanted from here as well. So now we're going to do that. And I can just go back a little ways to where my select data was. Now that we've ran that, you can see I'm selecting all the data, printing it out. And you can see we only have one user because I deleted the other one. So delete and update are very simple. And that's all there is to drizzle. Now, if you're interested in comparing drizzle and Prisma, you're definitely going to love my video linked right over here. Or if you want to deep dive into Prisma, which is an alternative to Drizzle, if you found this a little bit too low level or confusing, that'll be linked right over here as well. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.